Hey there, welcome back to Why Jesus Matters. Today we're going to be taking a look at um, a part of Jesus' story that usually we don't pay enough attention to. Um, I didn't pay enough attention to it for years. And then several years ago, uh, a man named Philip Yancey wrote a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. And he spent some time talking about the ascension of Jesus and what it meant, meant to him, how it actually bothered him for years, and then how he came to a realization of the importance of it, and it helped me to understand it. So that's what we'll be looking at today, why Jesus left and what he told us to do. Uh, that, that probably is, as Yancey said, I, the hardest part of Jesus' story wasn't his teaching, wasn't his miracles, wasn't even his resurrection. It was that he left us right at the point where he's ready to go, he's resurrected, he's, things are great, and then he says, I'm out of here, you guys have to finish this up. Uh, and the only reason he could do that was, of course, because he, one, prepared us, but then also, <clears throat> after he left, we still had one more important episode that we'll have next week uh, at, the, at the Day of Pentecost that really did prepare us for us. So we've only got two episodes to go, Day of Pentecost and the Revelation still to come. But today's and next week's uh, episode are really tied together. The Ascension of Jesus, the Day of Pentecost, all is about Jesus giving us a job, preparing us for it, giving us all the tools we need to fulfill that job. So <clears throat> let's walk through what Jesus did during, during the 40 days after his resurrection. So first thing, during the 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, he told them, that is the disciples, to care for the church, which is each other. So here's how it rolls. About two to three weeks after the resurrection, the disciples are in Galilee because that's where Jesus told them to go. And they were doing what fishermen do on the Sea of Galilee because that was their home and that was where they'd been. They left fishing to go and follow Messiah. Messiah is now gone, so they go back to fish, <laughs> right? And they go out all night and they catch nothing. And at dawn, about a hundred yards out, they see someone on shore. And he calls, asking him if they caught anything, and they say no. And he has them toss the the, the fish back in. And John looks at Peter and says. Oh, it, it's it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And on shore, Jesus has a fire going and he cooks some fish and he cooks some bread for them. They count their fish and it's 153 fish, so many that they're surprised the net didn't break. And then Jesus pulls Peter aside for a conversation. Now, I, I love reading that segment of scripture where it talks about that because the details are so specific. It tells you where they were, when they were there, exactly what part they were, how close they were when Jesus talked to them, how many fish there were, that Jesus had a fire ready, that Jesus ate fish with them. All of these are details that tell you that this is not a long ago and far away. This is not a once upon a time story. This is actually happening on the actual shores of the Sea of Galilee in real time and space with real people involved in it. And all of those aspects of it ground it into reality, which, as we saw in our last episode, is really important that Jesus actually physically rose from the dead. And, you know, ghosts don't make fires, ghosts don't cook fish on fires, and ghosts don't eat the fish that they cooked on fires. So that's a big part of the simple conversation or the simple way that the narrative is told there. So, as I said, Jesus then pulls Peter aside for a conversation. Three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Three times Jesus, Peter answers him, yes, I love you, until he gets exasperated. And Jesus three times tells him this, feed my sheep. In other words, take care of the church, take care of each other after I'm gone for good. So that's the first thing he told them was take care of each other. Second thing he told them to go and make disciples. This is what we call the Great Commission. It's the only command of Jesus that we find in all four Gospels and in the book of Acts. And it happens about two weeks after the resurrection. He meets them not in... in uh, in, in, on the shore of the Lake of uh, Sea of Galilee, but he meets them in a mountain in Galilee, and this is where he commissions them. I want you to go and and take the gospel to everybody. He then also says so uh, in the on the in as we'll see later in the book of Acts on the Mount of Olives just before he leaves. So he told them to care for each other. He told them to go and make disciples. He taught them the scriptures. Uh, Luke 24, 45 says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. This is after he has risen from the dead and just before he ascended. So he opened their minds so they could understand scriptures. Now, but before that, he did something else. While he was in the upper room after his resurrection, Jesus disappeared. So before he left them, the Bible tells us he anointed them with the Holy Spirit. We see that in the upper room in John chapter 20, 
verses 22 through 23, which says this, he, Jesus, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, this has been a hugely debated verse by theologians for centuries and will continue to be until Jesus comes back and answers all the questions for us. But I think what it means here is fairly simple. Uh, they received an anointing in the upper room between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, similar to the anointing that the Old Testament prophets would have received. Uh, it wasn't the same, it wasn't the baptism in the Holy Spirit that they received in the day of Pentecost, because if it was, they wouldn't have needed that. But now they have, after this anointing in the upper room, they have a calling upon them and an, an, an anointing for the calling, very similar to what the Levites would have had in the Old Testament. Uh, that they are to be the care, the caregivers of this message of the gospel to others. He then tells them at that point, meet uh, meet him on the Mount of Olives, and they go and they meet him on the Mount of Olives. And the last time they had met there was right before, or actually right after the Last Supper, when the Romans came and arrested Jesus and brought him off to be crucified. So, I want you to imagine this: you have walked with Jesus for three years. You have heard his claims of being Messiah. You've seen him do things that only Messiah could do. You walk through this horrific crucifixion. You wait for three days thinking it's all over. And three days later, miraculously, he rises from the dead. He tells you, go to Galilee and wait for me there. You go while you're fishing. He performs this miracle, that miracle. He's seen by people all over the place. He then has you come back. He anoints you for this special calling. Then he comes back and he meets you again on the Mount of Olives, where he was right before he was crucified. On the Mount of Olives, you can overlook, you know, Herod's temple. You can see, uh, you know, Pilate's house where he was tried. You can, you can, you maybe even see Golgotha where he was crucified. You can now look over everything. And Jerusalem, of course, is the capital for all the Jewish people. You are now overlooking the capital with a resurrected Jesus. And you're thinking at this point as a disciple, what are you thinking? It's showtime, man, <laughs> right? This is where Jesus is going to go, let's roll, and you're going to come down the mountain with a resurrected Jesus, and he's going to go into the temple, and he's going to clean house, and he's going to go into Pilate's house, and he's going to you know, kick Pilate out, and he's going to get rid of the Roman soldiers. He's going to assemble an army, right? That had to have been what was in their minds. We know it was because they kept coming back to that idea. That's what they thought. In fact, we know that because Acts 1-6 tells us this. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And the only understanding they had of that at that point was a political and military kingdom. They were expecting Jesus to, you know, kick butt and take names, right? <laughs> That's what they were wanting. They were, they were perfectly, they were strategically, geographically situated for an attack on Jerusalem. So that's what they were expecting. And in the anointing, they had been deputized since the last time they'd been there to do the job. So they asked this question, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus' answer in the very next verse is this, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by his own authority. It's like, I mean, this isn't the time, this isn't the date, this isn't the place. What do you mean? How can this not be the spot? Basically, Jesus is telling them, no, that's not what we're here to do. And they had to have been completely confused at that point. I mean, they were regularly confused by Jesus, of course. But at this point, this is, you could not get a better go time. They could not have imagined being in a better place, a better time with, with a better opportunity for Jesus to go in and be Messiah in the way they had expected him to be Messiah. That was as a political and a military conqueror. And Jesus says, no, that's not gonna happen. I want you to go to the city and I want you to wait. And when you wait, he tells them in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So he told them to wait in Jerusalem to receive a new anointing from the Holy Spirit. Now, wait a minute. Hadn't he already done that? Didn't we just read that verse a little while ago? Yes, in an Old Testament way. This is a new thing, as we'll see more in the next episode when we talk about the day of Pentecost. But for now, the Gospel of Luke says he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And then at this point, on the Mount of Olives, overlooking Jerusalem, after Jesus says, I want you to go back and I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit, the Gospels that do give this account give the most matter-of-fact account of one of the most amazing <laughs> events in the Bible. Matthew and John don't even mention it. 
Mark barely mentions it. And, and there's even a debate about the, the, you know, the authenticity of that. We're left with Luke, really, who tells it in the end of Luke and also retells it in a slightly different way at the beginning of Acts. And he's the only one that really gives us an account. And he tells it in just the most mundane, straightforward way. But that's the way Luke is. Dr. Luke just sticks to the facts. Okay. So it says that he reaches out his hands to bless them. And while he's blessing them, Jesus starts to levitate. He starts to rise in the air and he keeps on going and he keeps rising and he keeps rising and he keeps rising until the Bible says the clouds receive him out of their sight. They're so amazed by watching this happen that they don't notice that there's two new men who appeared, appeared among them. And all of a sudden, these two guys among them start to speak up and go, basically, essentially, they say, hey, what you're looking at? And they're like, well, who are you? Right? We see it in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking at the sky? I love the question. Like, isn't the answer obvious? Jesus just floated up and disappeared into the clouds. That's why we're staring in the sky. He told us to wait. We're waiting. Like, he went up. We don't know what's going to happen yet, but we're waiting. What do they say? Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus. I think that's really important. The angels say this same Jesus, not Jesus in another format of another type. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, he went into the sky. He's going to come back out of the sky, which we see later on in the book of Revelation again, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. So, but before the disciples can even answer that question, they tell him Jesus is going to return in the same way he left. They remember, oh yeah, Jesus told us, go back to the city and wait there. So they went back and they waited in Jerusalem. Now, again, we've got to take out of our heads all the stuff that we know happens after that. Can you imagine if we can putting ourselves in their position? You've gone through all this time with Jesus. From the Mount of Olives is where he was arrested, and then he was tried, he was crucified. He rises from the dead. For 40 days, he walks among them. He does these amazing things with them. He deputizes them through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He meets with them back on the Mount of Olives, overseeing Jerusalem. He tells them, after I go, I want you to go and wait for me. They then see him ascend into the clouds, and angels appear and say, uh, go back and wait, like he told you. What do you think they were expecting when they were waiting in Jerusalem? I'm thinking they were praying with what with a head bow but one eye open like cuz they right they'd been in the upper room before when he appeared out of nowhere. They'd been in a boat when he appeared on the shore out of nowhere. They were used to Jesus appearing out of nowhere. I think part of the reason why Jesus ascended the way that he did was to show them uh this is not just me like disappearing like Star Trek and I'm not going to reappear that way and why the angel said this same Jesus is going to come in the way you say, saw him go. But as we saw often, the disciples are quite often clueless, as we are. And so I think they were probably wondering, is he going to show up through the walls again? But what we just see here on the screen right now is he's going to come back in the way he left. He's not going to just appear in the room all of a sudden. This next time he comes back is going to be very different. But they're probably still holding on to those previous assumptions. They're probably still expecting Jesus to come back as a military and political conqueror. Um, and, and, you know, but here we are. Uh, Jesus still hasn't returned. It's, um, you know, almost 2,000 years later. And again, two more episodes, we'll talk about that a little bit. But they're, we're still waiting after Jesus' ascension. So the last thing Jesus did among us um, in his resurrected body was to ascend into heaven. So what does the ascension mean? Well, that's, that's how it went. Through, that's how it played out. What does it mean for us? What does the ascension mean to them? What does it mean to us? And let me walk you through four things. Jesus' ascension tells us four things. First, it tells us that Jesus' mission is now our mission. This was the issue that Yancey had, right? Philip Yancey, as I told you at the beginning of this. How could Jesus just leave after he's ready to go? He's he's raised from the dead. He is now obviously Messiah, and then he just goes, right? It, 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 every time I, I think about that, it reminds me of the first time we took our daughter Veronica home, you know, many years ago when, uh, from the hospital when she was born. And, I, and I, I've, I've talked about this, and I've had other parents, first-time parents, share exactly the same feelings. We walk out of this hospital for the first time with this infant, and we've never cared for kids before. I was never a babysitter. Shelly was never a babysitter. And I remember very distinctly walking out with this little baby going, how could they just hand us this kid and expect us to take care of it? We don't know what we're doing. I can imagine that the disciples probably felt like that for a while. Like, how could Jesus just leave and leave the job to us? We don't know what we're doing. We need, we've we been relying on Jesus' physical presence for the last three years, and now all of a sudden, he's gone. But instead, here's what he told them in Matthew 16, 19, before he left, he said this, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Reminds me of the first time you give the teenagers a kid, you know, the, your teenager the keys to the car. Yet, you know, every parent's got to do it at some point. We've got to let them go, right? I've noticed parenthood is a, ste- a series of steps of letting kids go from 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 the womb to being breastfed to being bottle fed to feeding at the table, feeding them at the table to letting them feed themselves at the table to going off to school, off to college, an apartment, getting married. Right, every one of these is a step of letting go. Jesus did that with us. He walked with us for three years, the the disciples for three years. Then he sent them out on short missions trips, and they came back from those missions trips to report in. In the last 40 days after his resurrection, he would either tell them to go somewhere on their own, like Galilee or Jerusalem, and say, I'll meet up with you there later, instead of him going with them. It's, It's a series of steps of letting go a little bit more, and then he leaves them entirely. So Jesus did what he needed to do. He showed them that he loved them. He trained them. He blessed them, and then he left them to do the job. And his job is now our job. That's a gutsy thing for Jesus to do. But just like with everything else in our life, as long as somebody keeps doing it for us, we're not going to step up and do it ourselves. So Jesus leaving did it so that his job is now our job. So that's the first thing. Second thing, Jesus' ascension tells us that we can't do this alone. Christianity is not a solo sport. Almost everything Jesus says in the last two cha- in the last few chapters of his talking to his disciples tell us two things one that we need each other this is where he says things like this a new commandment i give unto you love one another as i have loved you by this will all men know that you are my disciples that you have loved one for another feed my sheep he tells peter three times right this is is one of the key things he keeps telling them in his last address to them we need each other and secondly we need the holy spirit we have to have the comforter. He says this multiple times during his season between his resurrection and his ascension. He tells them about the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7 is an example of that. It is for your good that I am going away. Right? So he tells them straight up, like, if you ask the question, Jesus, why did you leave? He says, because it's for your good. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So That's why he had to leave so the Holy Spirit could come and live in us and not just with us. You see, when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus was the body in which the Holy Spirit lived. And as long as Jesus is here, he takes up all the Holy Spirit's bandwidth, right? So when Jesus had to depart so that the Holy Spirit could come in all of us so that we could do the things that the Holy Spirit needs to do through us. So that's the second thing. Third thing that the Jesus ascension tells us is this, that Jesus was risking everything on us. He was risking everything on us. After the ascension, God became invisible again. For the entire Old Testament, except for a couple small portions, you know, on a mountain and, uh, and you know, and once or twice with Moses uh, in front of the Ark of the Covenant, God was an invisible presence. Uh, and for three years, he walked, he walked in ministry and for just probably around 30 altogether, he was a physical presence on the earth. And now he becomes invisible again. And this is a big risk, right? When you've got somebody physically with you, it's easy to remember them. When somebody disappears out of your life for a while, it's like, you know, unless it's someone who's really close to you that you really miss, it's easy to forget people when they're not physically around. So that was a risk that Jesus took. I'm not going to physically be there. How are they going to remember me? After all, Jesus left nothing behind. He didn't even leave a dead body behind. No well-known historical figure left less behind than Jesus left behind. He didn't write a book. He didn't assemble an army. He didn't build any buildings. He didn't make a sculpture or a painting. He didn't invent anything. He left nothing physically behind to remind us that he was here. At the moment of his ascension, there was virtually nothing on this earth to mark that he'd been here. I believe he had to do that because if he had left physical things behind, we'd worship the stuff. I mean, through years, people have venerated and worshiped what were so-called splinters of the cross and nails from the cross. And, you know, the, the search for the Holy Grail has been made movies about it. I don't think any of these things will ever be fine because of our tendency to worship the thing instead of the one who gave us the thing. There's no record of Jesus ever having written anything. He's the only major religious leader who didn't write a book or anything that he left to his followers. And yet he still has the biggest footprints in history. Why? Take a look at what he told them to do. John 14, verses 12 through 14. 
Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to my Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. What did Jesus leave behind? He left us behind. He left us behind with a job to do. And any evidence that we're going to see on earth of Jesus is going to be what we have done because Jesus left nothing physical behind. He left us behind to continue the job that he gave us. And thankfully, again, as we'll see next episode, he gave us all the equipment we need by giving us the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do that. This is a totally new idea. Nobody before or since has ever even attempted to do that. And yet what's happened out of that? Christianity has been for 2000 years and counting the fastest growing organism on the face of the earth. It is relentless no matter what comes against us. So we are still that place you know, because Jesus chose us, we are what Jesus left behind. And then the fourth thing that the Ascension tells us is this, that Jesus will complete the mission when he comes back. He's going to start by judging the job we did, right? The Bible says the judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So don't worry about that because the job is love God and love others, right? That's what he said. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. A new commandment I give to you, love one another, right? All of his instructions were love God, love others. So when he judges us, it's going to be about, did we love God? Did we love others? It's not about whether we did any things that other people might consider great works, but it's, did we love God? Did we love others? Remember, the angels then said, this same Jesus is going to come back. So when he comes back, it's going to be the same Jesus who left. And what's interesting is, um, of the of the parables about Jesus' second coming, of, there were about 40 of them. And of the last eight parables that Jesus told, six of them, were not just about the second coming, but about being ready for the second coming. He prepared his disciples, I'm going to come back and you really don't know when. So keep doing the job and be ready because when he comes back, he's going to make everything right. And what did he say about the people who weren't going to be ready when he comes back? Luke 12, 40 tells us this, you must also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. We need to be ready because let's not be like you know, kids holding a party at the house when mom and dad are gone for the weekend and having a lookout posted in case mom and dad pull in the driveway. Let's not do it that way. Let's live worthy of the risk that Jesus took by leaving and leaving the job in our hands. And I think certainly we need to do better than we've done in the previous two millennia. We need to do better. In fact, again, more of that in two episodes. When Jesus comes back, he will make everything right. This is one of the important reasons why we believe so much in the second coming is if you take a look around, you realize this is not the world God intended. And uh, it, just as we started with him being the creator and creating a perfect place that we broke, we will end in two weeks from now with a place that Jesus comes back to and makes right again. But before we do that, next episode, we're going to talk about the time in between. We're going to get to Acts 2, particularly the day of Pentecost, and we're going to talk about the church and how God in us changes everything. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks.